With the men comes mechanized support, the fast-moving Antos tank killer searching out its target. Hello again everyone, it's me, Matt. Hope you're having a great day. We're talking about some tracked vehicles again, and this thing is just dog ugly and extremely peculiar. I wasn't really aware of this vehicle ever existing, to be not honest with you, and I think many of you may agree, unless you've played things like War Thunder, all those video games that give it a bit of showcasing. It's a very unique piece of equipment, the Ontos, otherwise known as the Thing in Greek. Uh, the M50, to be precise, is a very strange little tank destroyer, I guess, designed back in the day to be used with the US Marine Corps, the US military, during the sort of late 1940s, 1950s. Now, the original Ontos was developed as an alternative to the M56 Scorpion, which was an airborne self-propelled gun. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, the US military recognized the need for a light, mobile tank killer that would be able to traverse even rough terrain to ambush the enemy as well as be deployed via parachute drops via a cargo plane, arriving on the ground practically combat ready. The ability to engage armored targets in the field was deemed critical for US airborne forces in order to fight off inevitable tank counterattacks. This was a lesson learned that was paid unfortunately in blood during World War II on the Normandy landings. This meant that the vehicle had to be kept extremely light, and indeed the Scorpion weighed a mere 7 tons, being a little more than a basic suspension with a large, at least compared to the hull, 90mm gun on top of it. What was saved in weight was however, of course, sacrificed in protection and stability. The gun operators were protected only by a small gun shield with the hull lacking any true ballistic protection whatsoever. In other words, the crew was almost completely exposed to enemy fire, and anything bigger than a pistol round would more than likely go through the hull like butter. Additionally, the light chassis had serious problems coping with the recoil of the gun. Every shot made, the entire vehicle jumped back like a startled horse, and it was clear that a full-powered gun, which the 90mm M54 was, was simply just far too much for both its hull and suspension to handle. The gun itself had enough potential to knock out a T-54 at 1km, penetrating some of the 200mm of armour, roughly the equivalent of a T-54 frontal protection. But the price was steep indeed. So, the Ontos was born of the same mindset but had several key differences, most notable being the fact that the standard rifle gun was replaced with a set of recoilless ones, almost protruding like a spider off the top of it. Recoilless guns have a number of advantages and of course drawbacks. As their name suggests, they produce a very low recoil when fired, which means that even relatively weak platforms, jeeps, tripods and such, can be used to carry this kind of caliber usually only reserved for tanks and large SPGs. They are also generally very light and portable, making them quite a potent infantry tool to take out enemy armor, such as the Karl Gustav, which I have done a video on if you want to go check that out. On the downside though, these guns dissipate shell NG not by turning it into recoil, but projecting it outward through their back, which means that whoever stands behind of the firing of a recoilless gun is going to have a very bad day. Furthermore, these low power guns, imagine them more as lobbers really than actual guns, means that they cannot fire shells that rely on true kinetic energy, such as a APF SDS or armored piercing fin stabilized discarding sabre round. Recoilless guns typically only fire high explosive shaped charge shells, making them, much like RPGs, of limited use really against vehicles with good anti-high explosive anti-tank protection. With the low or no recoil produced by these weapons, you can easily mount more than one on the chassis, but the designers of the Ontos really stepped on it and actually used six 105mm M40A1C recoilless rifles at once. Actually, that's a bit of an oversimplification. The development process of the Ontos was in fact a bit more complex, with several variants with four guns or even just one gun proposed, but it was the six gun variant that was actually built. It's worth noting that these 105mm recoilless rifles are commonly referred to as the 106mm. 
Their actual calibre though was 105mm, but they were marked as 106mm to make sure the ammunition for them wasn't to be confused with the other used 105mm calibre shells. The same solution, for example, was used during the Second World War for the M10 tank destroyer. As mentioned already, the Ontos was originally developed for the US Army around 1952, with the first prototype by Alice Chalmers being completed the same year. It was essentially a large steel box with frontal sloped armour that was 1.7mm thick all around. What that meant was the Ontos could, unlike the Scorpion, withstand some rifle fire, but was very vulnerable to heavy Soviet machine gun, AP bullets, and of course, anything heavier. Protection against HE shell fragments was adequate even though the artillery fire could render the Ontos useless, as the external mounted weapons could be heavily damaged from any shrapnel being taken from indirect fire. Another thing to note was its poor anti-mine protection, the things built like a wafer thin. The bottom was less than 5mm thick, which became a serious problem in Vietnam, especially when you're dealing with guerrilla warfare. The vehicle had a crew of three and was powered by an off-the-shelf General Motors SL12340 4.9 litre, or 302 cubic inches, if you are partial to the original designation, 127 horsepower inline six-cylinder engine, and a simple and rugged power plant that was more than enough to take it its 8.6 tons moving at 48 kilometers an hour. This allowed it to keep up the tanks of the era on and off the road. The operational range was some 300 kilometers at most, with fuel consumption being roughly 60 to 210 liters of gasoline per 100 kilometers, which is pretty good. The engine got upgraded though in the mid-1960s to the Chrysler 5.91 litre or 361 cubic inch V8 that was producing 145 horsepower. These modified M50s are referred to as the M50A1. Some sources claim the output of the original engine was actually 145 horsepower and the output of the upgraded one was 180 horsepower. This is most likely caused by the use of different measures of measuring these kinds of horsepower, whether it be crankshaft versus wheel, etc. The most interesting part, of course, was the weapon system, though. Those six M40A1C 105mm recordless rifles that could be electrically fired from inside the vehicle. They, however, had to be reloaded from the outside, making the loader's job not exactly the safest one in the army. The guns were turret mounted and could swing around and depress and elevate, minus 10 to plus 20 degrees. The aiming system was very, very basic, with each of the recoilless rifles being fitted with a 12.7mm 50 caliber spotting rifles that fired a trace around with the same ballistic trajectory of the shells of the main weapon. That way, the gunner could physically see where his shells would land prior to actually firing the main projectile. This is something we see on other more modern common weapon systems such as the Small and even the Carl G. These guns can be fired at a single gun at any time or in pairs. You can also fire all four at once or all six at once. The important part was to have equal force on each side of the turret. They fired heat and high explosive and canister rounds, interestingly enough, with the rate of fire being somewhere around four rounds per minute when aiming. It took roughly one minute to reload one gun. It's interesting to compare the heat rounds of the Ontos and the 90mm full size rounds of the Scorpion. The Ontos heat rounds could penetrate roughly 400mm of steel armour, that's twice that of the Scorpion kinetic rounds, but were ineffective at longer ranges, even though the Ontos could fire longer distances by elevating its guns at roughly 1km, the tracer rounds from the spawning rifles would pretty much veer off from the main gun shell trajectory, making it extremely hard to actually aim accurately. The Scorpion would be able to hit its target better at longer ranges, but it would also lose its T-54 frontal penetration capability. In this sense, both vehicles were kind of handicapped in their intended tank killing role at distances of one kilometer or longer. But the Ontos was, as a more stable platform, generally performing better at shorter ones. Despite this fact, the US Army went with the Scorpion. The Ontos project was initially rejected, but the US Marine Corps stepped in and ordered 300 of the vehicles that were delivered between 1956 and 1957. The reasons for this decision were mostly practical. The Marines had a long history of ordering stuff from their Army colleagues to get their hands on something new fast. They also favoured self-reliance and the Ontos appealed to them. It was a simple machine with its engine parts being pretty much readily available and its systems being very easy to learn. The Ontos saw action several times before it was deployed to Vietnam. 
In one of the weirdest tank actions of post-war history, the Ontos knocked out a Swedish World War II-era Landsverk L-60 tank during the 1965 American intervention in the Dominican Republic. It was the Asian service, however, that made it famous. With the exception of one or two events, it was never really used as an anti-tank vehicle during the Vietnam War. Instead, it was deployed as a heavy fire support system to various marine infantry units. It excelled in urban combat. A single salvo could level an entire building and the Vietnamese quickly learned to fear these vehicles. In other cases, it was essentially used as artillery, firing indirectly at long ranges and bombarding the enemy into submission, even though not really that accurately. During Operation Jack's Day, the Viet Cong attempting to attack the river shipping only ran into one Ontos installed on the deck of an LST-class ship, the USS Henry County. The result of the operation was 63 dead Vietnamese. The canister rounds were especially devastating against the charging Viet Cong troops, with a single Ontos being able to be actually taking out hundreds of these troops at any one time with just a few salvos. The HE rounds, on the other hand, turned out to be very effective against improvised entrenched positions in the jungle. It was not all sunshines and rainbows, of course, and, of course, the vulnerability to mines took its toll on the Ontos vehicles, especially their crews. The chance to survive a mine detonation was further lowered by the fact that the vehicle was also packed with spare ammunition that would, of course, explode in addition to the mine. Crew casualties were very high in general. The vehicle had very thin armour after all, and was not really meant for close range combat even though its firepower turned out to be, especially during the Hue operation, and very invaluable at that. The Ontos would become one of those vehicles that mostly lived and died with one war, and in 1968 the Battle of Hue, and one of the bloodiest battles of the Vietnam War, marked its decline. Spare parts were rare even before, but in 1969 Americans faced a serious shortage and were forced to cannibalise broken M50s with only a limited number of them operational at any given point. Finally, a year later, the US Marines forces in Vietnam had fought so hard in Hue but had retreated, and at that point they had to leave the country, leaving a lot of their gear behind, including some of the surviving M50s. To the US Army that remained, they were still there till 1973, and some of the vehicles were brought back to life. They were generally worn out, however, and were relegated to the role of static turrets, which is a sad state of mind knowing that any track vehicle get turned into a static turret brings a little bit of a tear to my eye. Of the 300 M50s built, about a dozen or so survived to this day. Most of these were saved by private collectors by restoring the civilian operated machines to their former combat look. This is quite an achievement considering the limited production run of the Ontos and a testament to its fame, and that to this day it still goes way beyond its normal combat impact considering the design that it was chosen for, and almost turned into a multi-purpose infantry support and tank destroyer. The Ontos is quite a cute and kind of strange little vehicle, but for the most part those six guns being able to push so much firepower downrange, whether it be an infantry support role, or taking out soft skinned or lightly armoured vehicles, puts this little thing in quite the contender of being a, actually quite a capable vehicle. I must admit, I would not want to be a crew member of one of these things going up against other armoured vehicles, I'd be terrified, but it would be quite a nice little addition to have for the infantry pushing those six cannons into play, taking out buildings and entrenched positions. I just wouldn't want to be driving it. These are the kind of vehicles, and I've done videos on this in the past, that need to be automated. They need to be plugged in or wirelessly connected. No crew members. The infantry can reload them as needed. It carries its own ammunition. All self-contained. If it gets knocked out, so what? The battle moves on. No one's been killed and we carry on moving. You could even have the weapon systems be deployable off the platform and move on. But of course, back in the day, that technology didn't exist, so the poor old crew members were put in place instead. And You know, the thinness of that armor, even as the underbelly at 5mm, <laughs> just I'd be terrified driving anywhere, especially in sort of a guerrilla combat environment like uh, Vietnam. So anyway, folks, I hope you learned a little bit about the M50 Ontos. If you want to learn more about it, please let me know. I'll see if I can do some more research on it. Um, if you've uh, ever driven one of these things, or had experience on them, I'd love to hear from you in the comment section below. If you did enjoy today's video, please leave me a like. If you're new to my channel, I'd really appreciate you hitting that bell button by the subscribe button uh, to be notified of any upcoming videos in the future. Uh, if you want to support my channel, you can check out my Patreon page. All the links for things like that are in the description box below, including Facebook, my Discord channel, so you can come chat to me, merchandise store and all that good stuff. I really appreciate you stopping by today, guys, and I will see you on the next one. All the best. Bye-bye.